Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Brent Dennis, director of the San Francisco Botanical Garden and director of the Conservatory of Flowers. Brent came to the Botanical Garden after having led the Frederick Meyer Gardens and Sculpture Park in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which became the second most visited attraction in the state under his tenure. The San Francisco Botanical Garden cultivates a bond between people and plants by operating a public garden, offering education programs, and conserving the environment. Brent has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Brent, for joining us today. My pleasure, Mark. It's great to be here. The San Francisco Botanical Garden is a true treasure. It is located in a place where, where the um, environmental conditions for such a garden are, are uniquely suited to, the, to exhibit a, a grand diversity of, uh, of plants. And the garden itself has a long history. Could you describe the garden itself, its physical plant, and, and some of its history? Oh, certainly. Yeah, within Golden Gate Park, which is 1,017 acres, uh, the Botanical Garden stretches from 9th Avenue all the way down to 10th Avenue on the southern side of Golden Gate Park. It comprises uh, what we sometimes call a pork chop shaped uh, parcel of 55 acres. We have two main entrances that are on the, the northern edges of the Botanical Garden. We have a somewhat sprawling physical plant in the northeast or the southeast corner of the Botanical Garden. Uh, we have the County Fair Building, which is uh, a major gathering point for the Bay Area Garden Clubs and a lot of our plant societies, which over time have been tremendous supporters of all of the things that we do to present not only world-class botanical collections, but also some of our uh, educational programs that really draw the community out to experience that, that dynamic to, uh, again, connect people to plants. The unique climate of, of San Francisco is really uh, what allows us to have a world-class signature garden. It's very Mediterranean in terms of its uh, temperate zone. Uh, so for that reason, we really are a wonderful tapestry of what I call the global garden. So we have specialty gardens that um, successfully um, present gardens from Australia, New Zealand, uh, the Chilean or Andean uh, mountain ranges. Uh, we have uh, a South African garden, as well as a lot of the traditional plants through uh, some of the rainforest, the more temperate rainforest zones. Uh, we have a Mesoamerican rainforest, for example, and we're now really working hard to create a Southeast Asian uh, rain or cloud forest. So the, um, the visitor experience is really enriching when people, especially uh, what's heartwarming to me is to encounter visitors from all around the world when they walk into the botanical garden and they really find the, the botanical collections very authentic. It feels like they're back home. So for that reason, it's really a, a very positive motivating or driving force for our gardening staff and for our educational program staff, knowing that we have this tremendously unique opportunity to really showcase um, the rich diversity of plants from all around the, the globe. And then in addition, under your uh, responsibility, you also have the uh, conservatory, which was uh, renovated after after considerable storm damage about uh, what was... Correct. Yeah, back in... Uh, I think it was 1997, there was a really harsh windstorm with gale force winds that uh, unfortunately, I mean, there's the positive aspects because the Conservatory of Flowers has a wonderful history. It was the first structure erected in Golden Gate Park. It's still the longest standing wood and glass greenhouse or conservatory, uh, at least in the Western Hemisphere. It's quite striking. It is a Victorian um, grandeur of its of its central dome and the finials and and inside the conservatory, um, we, we do present a tropical uh, collection. So we have a lowlands as well as a highlands tropical collection. Uh, we have an aquatics gallery, which is enriched by wonderful, you know, the Victorian water lilies. And uh, we have a really outstanding bromeliad collection. Uh, and then our potted plants gallery is really a true reflection back to the Victorian times when they, they traveled the world and would, would bring together uh, collected specimens from around the world, but for the most part they were grown in containers and our potted plants gallery really has uh, a wonderful um, collection of, of containers or planters uh, that are, have unique origins from all around the world also. And then the West Wing is uh, an exhibitions gallery and that's what we found over time to be a really important 
uh, kind of signature presentation for the conservatory in that we provide a lot of changing exhibitions. We do two major shows a year, and that, that gives people reasons to come back. And it really, for the local community, uh, strengthens our membership program, and our volunteers love uh, giving back to the community as docents uh, because of the high visitation levels, that they really like serving the visiting public in that regard. And then you also have responsibility for the Japanese Tea Garden. Yeah, just recently, about three months ago, I was promoted into, uh, uh, I guess, a, a, a broader um, management position. I'm now the Assistant Director of Operations for uh, Golden Gate Park. So I oversee all 1,017 acres. We have 66 gardeners and um, 18 custodians with park patrol responsibilities and then the structural maintenance aspect. So um, the park welcomes about 15 million visitors a year. So you can imagine um, just kind of the wear and tear of the constant maintenance responsibilities. 15 million in a city of? Yeah, the the metropolitan area, I mean, we're still, I think, the seventh largest metropolitan area in the country, but San Francisco proper, which, you know, in the, the 49 square miles, uh, we have just a little over 800,000 local residents. So, yeah, welcoming the world. Tourism is our biggest economic engine, and uh, we've really been working successfully with the, it's formerly the San Francisco Convention and Visitors Bureau. Their new name is the San Francisco Travel Association. But uh, they've been a real key and encouraging partner, realizing that Golden Gate Park is a absolutely must-see destination, but it's really never been marketed as such. That with the California Academy of Science and the De Young Museum of Art, along with the Conservatory of Flowers, the Japanese Tea Garden, and the Botanical Garden, we have five world-class uh, museum destinations all clustered together. So we've really been uh, working hard to promote Golden Gate Park is a full day experience for the visitor and, and uh, doing a lot of visitor amenity improvements to um, make their stay enjoyable. And it's fascinating to me that, that it is such an economic driver um, in, in San Francisco. It is um, a place where every tourist who visits San Francisco winds up in the park. Um, it is a place where a huge amount of economic activity takes place surrounding uh, the park itself and in the park uh, uh, as well. And the park has an identity as, as the heart of San Francisco, and there are so many residents of San Francisco that take advantage of the park. Talk about the various societies, the, also the, the nonprofit and government partnership that, that you have. Uh, it's a very interesting model. Oh, certainly, yeah. And I think um, you know, this resonates well across our country now as the economic times have become quite challenging. And, and uh, the public side of most of our public-private partnerships have, have really had the pressure of reduced um, public subsidy or support with um, diminished resources, whether it be human resources with staffing levels or just basic materials and supplies and such. So we've really found it to be uh, a win-win situation where we can match up, um, you know, by mission and also focus and purpose, a lot of our cultural institutions with not-for-profit partners. So for example, in Golden Gate Park, the San Francisco Botanical Garden has a 56-year uh, partnership history that's been very positive with the San Francisco Botanical Garden Society. And we've developed a very, um, I think, successful working relationship in co-managing the 55 acres in that the city and county of San Francisco through the Recreational Parks Department still is very committed to world-class garden maintenance. So we have 11 full-time gardeners. Uh, we also have um, a park section supervisor, then the custodial and uh, maintenance support that's needed for the physical plant primarily. And then over at the Conservatory of Flowers, we have a, another partner. <laughs> another staff. And so we have the San Francisco Parks Trust who had instrumentally raised the $25 million to restore the conservatory after the, the windstorm. And uh, for Led very good reasons. very dedicated people who've been, who've been in this, this field for decades. Absolutely, right. So the, um, the partnership that evolved after the restoration of the, the conservatory really was for strategic purposes. I think everyone realized that, that even though there was a brand new, fully restored conservatory turned back over to the city, 
um, there still was question if the Recreation and Park Department had the wherewithal, staff and, and financial resources to adequately maintain what was gifted back. So that co-management model uh, was developed. So um, this is, I think, the eighth year now that that's been successful. But at, at the conservatory, our Parks Trust partner, um, they again, similar to the Society at the Botanical Garden, they oversee uh, our visitor services program that administers admissions. We have a small gift shop, uh, so they, they operate that. Uh, the volunteer program in terms of recruiting and training and recognizing volunteers, that's part of it. Uh, we have an education department, and then uh, probably most importantly, again, is fund development. So having a membership program and doing a lot of the similar things. In fact, I left today from our, our gala planning committee. We have a pair of really uh, very energized and visionary co-chairs that are, are new to lead our plans for our um, November gala right before Thanksgiving. So lots of things going on and uh, it keeps me very busy, but it's really the energy that I, you know, derive from all of the really passionate, dedicated people that make up the teams at each. Uh, and then, of course, the community we serve. This morning as I walked through the conservatory to my meeting, just having all the kids there with their jungle guide tour uh, going through and saying, oh, I didn't know that's where bananas came from. Those kind of things. Uh, and then the opportunity we have to maybe spark interest in one of those young kids to maybe want to grow up and pursue a career in botany or environmental sciences or maybe become a landscape architect or, or something affiliated with the museum. It, it's just a wonderful opportunity for us. Well, one of the things that I find so interesting from a, from a um, point of view of, of looking at this from a, a leadership perspective is that um, you are, on the one hand, the director of these uh, various um, uh, knitted together organizations, the Botanical Garden, the Conservatory of Flower, but the governance of each of those organizations is different. Uh, the governance of the tea, uh, of the tea garden is slightly different from either of those. You have a government role and a non-governmental role, a, a, a nonprofit role. You have constituencies and funding sources that are all knitted together, not to mention the, the very influential communities that you serve, the various societies, the various flower societies and, and botanical, botanical societies. So on the one hand, you have an operations management element you have a command and control piece. You, you actually manage things and you, and you look for certain results and you, you are entrusted with the stewardship of, uh, of these various facilities. But on the other hand, you're also a cat herder and an influencer. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't control everything, but yet you are accountable for the outcomes. How, how does that work as you, as you interact with these various um, uh, people who, to whom you are accountable and to whom you report? Well, you know, my staff will probably say this better than, than I can, but I'm a very purpose-driven leader of sorts, and I'm very, uh, probably because I grew up uh, and was very athletic and on lots of teams and I coached a lot, I understood the dynamics of leadership and how you bring people together. Uh, it's important to communicate clearly what the vision and the direction that we want to go as a team or as a a work group would be, but also to make it clear to each person how they contribute and how everything fits to together. To that vision. So, so you exactly. create the vision in concert with, and you create buy-in, exactly. as opposed to saying, it's my vision, you know, this yeah, is... That's, well, it's not my personal style. I, I do know that there are other museums and other gardens and conservatories where the leadership has a different uh, philosophy and a different approach and tact. But for me, and I've been doing this for a couple decades, I've just found that that's the best and most successful uh, approach. That I try to be very inclusive. I, I, I think my staff will say that I, they find that I work very hard to bring the resources to bear to allow them to be successful. Um, we do work early on uh, to develop work plans for each uh, upcoming year. Um, we are very strategic in our planning. We have a master plan that's the, the basis for... So you have a the, master plan and then you have work plans? Uh, yeah, the, that it really is kind of the business kind of support plan. So, for example, my gift shop manager, she has 
um, goals. She has a revenue number. Exactly. And, and, and they're evaluated. We have per, a performance appraisal plan that's set up with their full um, you know, inclusion and understanding. And we agree upon that. And I, even though it's a major commitment of my time, I do devote an hour to each of my direct reports so that uh, we have an ongoing conversation throughout the course of the year. So it obviously always touches upon budgetary um, topics, but also you know their personal, professional, and then their their department goals, just to see how they're progressing. They've always said that you know the annual performance review is kind of anticlimactic because you know we deal with things that are challenges, and you know we celebrate the successes throughout the course of the year. So it's more of a formality at year's end, but it also allows us to take a really good hard look at, you know, did we accomplish what we wanted to and where we may have short, fallen short, and we want to you know, roll that into the next year. What can we do differently or what resources do we need to be able to be successful in that area? So it is, you know, it is very business-like, even though it's you know, a not-for-profit uh, arena. But um, I, I found that you, you really start with uh, the potential for success with really great people. And I think over the years I've found that you know, most of the teams that I've been able to assemble or the people I've been able to recruit, I really looked at their, their genuine um, you know, passion and their understanding of our mission. And, and do they seem like they would be excited about contributing? And would they be a good team player? And do they communicate effectively? Because most of the, um, you know, my colleagues that do have some challenges, you know, they usually trace it back to, it's just not the right chemistry. The person um, isn't communicating the way they need to, or they don't really understand how, you know, one plus one can equal three when you work together. So those are some of the, probably the, the traits or the characteristics of the successful teams that we've really been able together to accomplish great things. And it, it, again, it's all about serving the public. And that's probably the mantra that maybe my staff says, oh, you sound like a broken record. <laughs> but it, it is about reminding them that we're not here you know, to build our own resume. We're here to work together as a team to really you know, fulfill the mission of this organization and to welcome the visiting public to our programs, to our botanical experiences, to the opportunities to be a volunteer, to be a, a member, to be a supporter in some important way. So that's, that's kind of the fun part of it for me. So accountability is about serving the public. How do you measure success on a bottom line basis? Because you're not measuring success in terms of how much profit you make at the end of, uh, of every year. You do need to keep your, your uh, budgets within line and so on. But um, bottom line, when you have a year and, and you talk about your success, what kind of terms do you use when you well, talk? We to do yourself? have the obvious metrics that a lot of other museums and attractions, if you want to call us an attraction, are based on. But probably so what, our, our fund development staff has the most specific measurable ones, such as the growth in our membership program, how many people we kind of elevated up the membership ladder. To how many visitors you have? Yeah, our annual visitation, our, our program participants, the number of volunteer hours. Um, and then the sheer numbers of, of dollars that you know our gift shop can actually be successful in. Uh, we we look at per capita you know visitor um, expense or not expenses but um, revenues. You know if we have 500,000 visitors and we sold a million dollars in the gift shop, you can do the math and and see what that benchmark year was compared to the previous, and then maybe what our reasonable goal would be for the following year. So there are some very specific things. For the other areas, such as our facility maintenance areas, um, we have, uh, you know, we have a goals list that talks about our, our projected uh, investments that are needed. We know that we may have to replace the boilers. So, you know, if this year we do these type of preventative things, it might defer it for another year. But we also have to, and that's one of the, one of the things that um, my current teams are really more focused on now because we've built it into our team's performance is that uh, even though we're not for profit, when we do have net proceeds at the end of the year, we celebrate the realization that we can now put 10% you know, of that into our deferred maintenance fund. What are the major challenges that will confront the San Francisco Botanical Gardens and the, the, uh, the Tea Garden, the Conservatory of Flowers and so on, all these, these new responsibilities that, that for the first time in a very long time now come under 
the administration of one individual yourself. Right. Well, I always look at it in terms of opportunities. The you know the it's not a total blank slate because we do inherit things from our history, but. For me, there's so many um, efficiencies, and I put it in the context of our challenging economic times, that it does force us to be very uh, frugal, but also creative. And I think to, to look at the opportunities that are there with being more efficient with a lot of the common threads that run, at least through the specialty garden, so curatorial coverage and plant records keeping and, and um, co-marketing, you know, basically if we can get people to Golden Gate Park, they're going to experience all of us. So if we individually, like as the conservatory flowers or just as the tea garden or just as the, the San Francisco Botanical Garden, tried to go out on their ownness and attract people and attract uh, and the overhead costs groups. would be would explode. Right. So there's where there's an immense amount of economy and efficiency and smartness in terms of putting together a business approach that's very strategic that really does um, focus on quality um, presentations or you know quality collections, quality programs, and then getting the word out to your target audiences and give them reasons to not just visit once but to come back and to engage with you. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and thank you for your insights. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark.